Today's scripture reading is from uh, Isaiah 41 through 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way for, of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is cr grass and all its beauty is like the flower of the field the grass withers the flower fades when the breath of the lord blows on it surely the p people are grass the grass withers the flower fades but the word of our god will stand forever go on up to a high mountain o zion herald of good news lift up your voice with strength o jerusalem herald of good news lift it up Fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold, your God. Behold, the Lord of God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. The word of the Lord. You may be seated, and our kids can be excused to Children's Church. morning. Well, this morning, I have the privilege of opening up the scriptures that were just read for us from Isaiah 40. But before we get there, let me just give a quick recap. We're in the third week, uh, the third talk of Advent. Uh, the first uh, week, Pete kicked that off with the, the theme of hope, talking about how we need this anchor. We need this anchor for our soul right now, and that the coming of Christ the birth of Christ, the, the waiting, the expectation of him, and then his coming gives us that soul anchor of hope. Then last week, Brian spoke to us on the theme of faith found in Advent, that the invitation of Christ invites us into a faith that asks, sees, and costs. Hope, faith, and this morning I want to speak to the theme of joy. Now, I want to couple actually two themes here, if I can, the theme of joy and also comfort, because I think both are found in this passage that we just heard read for us from Isaiah 40. And what I want to do is I want to tie different thoughts and observations that are found in this passage around one question, one central question. And the question is, what is it about these words in Isaiah 40 that would have brought the people of Israel, comfort and joy. What is it about those words in Isaiah 40 that would have brought those people comfort and joy? Let me pray. God, in these next moments that we have together, we invite you to speak to us in such a way that it would not just be just information being disseminated and sort of going out from here, the pulpit, but much more than that. We ask that you would use these words as a means by which we are transformed in, more into your likeness, into your image, so that we become more like you, Lord. Speak to us. We are listening. In Christ's name, amen. If I were to ask you to use one word to describe the last two years, I wonder what word would come to mind. I bet there's probably not just one word. 
I want to suggest to you that whatever feeling or thought comes to mind when you hear that question, I want to suggest to you that we have something in common with the original listeners of these words in Isaiah 40. Words that were written to people, the people of God, in Babylonian exile, 6th century B.C. Now, what I want to do in these, just in the next few minutes is first look at the context because the context is going to help us understand the weight of these words that were spoken to the people of Israel. First, to understand the context, the first 39 chapters, before we get to this chapter of 40 in Isaiah, the first 39 chapters are filled with a message from Isaiah. Isaiah is the mouthpiece, so to speak, the prophet of God, giving words and voice to what God is saying, and he's telling them words of repentance. In other words, turn back, surrender to God. You need to actually stop the stuff you're doing that is actually turning you away from God. Turn back to God, surrender, submit your life to him, or there'll be judgment. And that judgment is exile. And that is exactly where we find ourselves in Isaiah 40. They are in the middle of exile. What does that mean? Well, part of this Babylonian takeover, which is really, if we just cut to the chase, that's what happens. Uh, Israel is just taken over by Babylon. What happens uh, if we look at some of the physical you know, furniture pieces of their culture? One, there's no king anymore. They don't have land anymore. They don't have the temple. Those were central things. They made up their identity. King, land, the temple, it's all gone. They have lost their sense of identity. They are failures. What does that mean? Well, as far as being a witness to the glory of God, they failed completely. And there's this feeling of defeat. There's no way out. They are bitter. They are disillusioned. And also there's a sense in which, actually there's not just a sense in which, they are, they have sort of blaming God, which we certainly have something in common there. When we get into stuff, that's part of our default. We also blame God. But more than that, disappointment was all pervasive. That's also where we share common ground. If we think of the last two years, just the broken expectations where we, we see, we feel there's this light, this proverbial light at the end of the tunnel, and it's just, it evades us. It's just not where we thought it would be. They feel that God has left them. And so more than anything, they were in a wilderness. And I, I would suggest to you, if, even if there's pushback on the point so far, that much is true. They are in a wilderness. They were in a wilderness. And we certainly have been in a wilderness these past couple of years. It feels as though we're in this wilderness. And perhaps the most striking blow for them at a psychological, at an emotional level, would have been the fact that this all could have been avoided. They were warned. They had years of warning. This could have been avoided. And now, because of their lack of faithfulness to Yahweh, they are in exile. Now, the reason why all these details are important is because that is the culture into which Isaiah speaks the words, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Isaiah, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is seeing into the future and announcing a message from God. And this, as the starting point of, a, of, the, of his message, would have been shocking. Because all they're hearing to this point is judgment. So there is certainly this expectation of this is how it is now and this is how it's going to end. And it's as if Isaiah, by the power of God, is announcing a completely different narrative. Yeah, there's judgment now, but that's not the end game. Comfort is how it ends. Comfort. Comfort. Notice how actually in verse 1, it's said twice. The word comfort is twice. That uh, is all, it's a, it's a literary device in the Hebrew. It's this idea of emotional intensity. It's as if Isaiah, it gives us the picture of Isaiah with emotional intensity saying, take comfort. And slowly, almost blow by blow here, we see that in these words of God through Isaiah, he's answering questions that have either been articulated or are in their mind. First question they are asking is, is God still our God? 
are we still are we still his people? They're thinking actually probably they're not even asking that. They've concluded we're done. We are not his people. He he's abandoned us. And how does it begin? Comfort, comfort my people. God is saying, you're still my people, says your God. I'm still your God. In other words, your disobedience, it's gotten you in it. You are, you're, you're done. But that has not broken my covenantal love. That's part of the message when God is speaking through Isaiah saying, you're still my people, I'm still your God. Then we come to verse 2, this language of your warfare is ended. What does that mean? Well, we know this much. Again, we have to know the context here. There's no battle going on at that point. There's no physical battle or war going on. This idea of warfare is speaking of the enmity against God, their hostility towards God. And God is saying, that is over now. That, that time of warfare, the enmity with me is over The time, in other words, the time of discipline is over. I'm not against you, says God. You still belong to me. I will never disown you. Yes, there will be discipline for your persistent disobedience. But the last word is always comfort. Let me just stop there for a moment. In a way, this, this makes complete sense. If we think of this, these words comfort, the words of comfort through the lens of a good father or a good mother, because being a good mother and good father does mean at times disciplining, uh, providing discipline to our children because of their, their disobedience. But that's not the end game. The fundamental principle and goal of being a good mother and father is not this perpetual mode of discipline. It's actually comfort. So this, this only makes sense that the father would be speaking these words of comfort, not of judgment. Then we, we move, we're going so quickly here, we move to verse 3 to 5. A voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And there are these top, this, there's this topographical landscape. The hills need to be put down, the highway, make the highways clear. That's a metaphor to a deeper reality. It's not just giving a topographical uh, reality, actually. That is a metaphor. It's a picture pointing to a deeper reality. But let me just stop there for a moment. (laughs) My uncle, uh, his name is uh, Sundar, my uncle Sundar, he grew up in India, born and raised there. And uh, he tells a story of years ago. So this is going back approximately 60 years when the queen visited India. And at the time, the cities, the, the city streets, the town streets, the highways, a lot of potholes. And so to prepare for the queen's visit, India had this massive charge of making sure all the roads, the roads that the queen would be traveling on, all these potholes were filled in. So she would have a smooth journey on all the town streets, on all the city streets, on all the highways, no potholes. Why? Because the queen was coming. It had to be smooth. This idea that we see in verses 3 to 5, Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. Uneven ground shall become level. And the rough places a plain. It's a metaphor to the condition of the heart. Isaiah is saying, prepare your heart. You need to be ready. Ready yourself for the, for the what? For the king. What about the king? He's coming. The king is coming. What is he going to do? He's going to save you. Global salvation is possible. That is a possibility now. The impossible is now possible. The king is coming. You need to prepare your hearts. That means there's this disruptive sense of I need to repent. I need to actually come back to him. Surrender to him because he's coming. The king is coming. Then we come to verse 5. And we read these words, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And we need to stop there for a moment because one of the major enemies to reading the scriptures for many of us is over-familiarity. We've read these words and this, this, there are different terms that are just, well, they tend to wash over us. And one is the glory of the Lord. We, we hear the words, we hear, we hear that turn, turn of phrase so often. What does that mean, the glory of the Lord? Well, let's fast forward and look to the Gospels. How does John describe it? John 1, verses 14, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. 
Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Listen to the words of pastor and author Ray Ortland, who comments on this. The glory of the Lord, therefore, is God himself becoming visible. God bringing his presence down to us. God displaying his beauty before us. The true answer to our deepest longings. And he promises to do this for us. It's the central promise of the gospel. What is the glory of God? It's a massive series that could be written right there, just on what is the glory of God. But really, just bringing it down here in a few words, the glory of God is God making himself visible. The radiant, blazing hot embodiment of God. We now know through the eyes of Jesus, that is Jesus. The word becoming flesh, dwelling among us. The glory of God is God himself becoming visible. Then we move along to verses 6 to 8. What, is, what do these words mean? All flesh is grass and then the grass withers. Well, that's speaking to humanity, this contrast between what humanity is like and what God is like. All flat, flesh is grass, grass withers. That's saying to us, humanity is not reliable. We're very flawed. But then God is not, because what does Isaiah say? The word of our God will stand forever. We human beings are unreliable. God is not. Then as we move along here in this passage, there's a crescendo that starts to build. Zion and Jerusalem are told to go to a high place. And not only are they instructed to go to a high place, they are, they are told to, yes, go to a high place, but shout it out. Lift it up. Why? why? Why must they do this? Why do they need to go to a high mountain? Why do they need to shout it out? I want to suggest to you one of the reasons is because it's going to be hard to believe. It, in other words, Isaiah is saying, it's going to be hard to, for these people to believe. So you need to go up to the highest place you can find and shout it out, behold your God. You're going to need to shout this out because they are going to have trouble believing this. That I'm coming, but actually the word is comfort, not judgment. Now here is where I'd like to come back to the question. I asked earlier, the question is, what is it about these words that would have brought the people comfort and joy? And like, I'd like to answer this question with a series of God is statements. God is statements. First, we look at verse 9. And really zooming in on this statement, this, this Statement, behold your God. What is that telling us? First, it's instructing God's people that God is involved. A baseline understanding of the words, behold your God. What is that telling us? God is involved. Now, if you'll allow me a very cheesy pop culture reference here. It was the rap artist, get ready for this, the rap artist LL Cool J, in his song, Mama Said Knock You Out, in which he penned the words, don't call it a comeback, I've been here for years. Don't call it a comeback, I've been here for years. I, I know I'm, some of you are thinking, hold on, did we just hear LL Cool J quote it in a sermon? It's true, it's true. It, I know, it's almost like, how on earth is LL Cool J popping up here? But let's just stay there for a moment because there's a sense in which that idea would have been shocking what does that mean? Well, let's look at the pop culture reference for a moment. Often you hear that kind of turn of phrase in sports. So the, if the star quarterback comes back, with, you know, they, he leads the team in a mounting comeback, and they're down by it. Like, they've they got a massive deficit, and they come back and they win the, the, the whole show. And they, they stick the microphone in the quarterback's face after the game, and what does he say? We were never out of it. Never out of it. Don't count us out. We were always in this thing. We knew. We knew we were in it. We were never out of it. Now, that might be some bravado, but the idea is, don't call it a comeback. There's a sense in which God's involvement here means that he is saying his, to his people, I haven't left you. 
I see you. I'm still involved. I'm still in control. I've never been out of it. The message for God's people in 6th century BC is the same for us today. Despite the circumstances, never count God out. And that is extremely difficult when we are so dependent upon what we see, what we feel, and the situations around us. Behold your God. In other words, here is your God tells us fundamentally God is involved. Never count him out. And somehow by God's grace, by the power of his spirit, we have to resist the tendency to discount God's involvement in our lives and in our world. That perhaps is one of the most difficult challenges that we face right now. Never count God out. Now there's so much to tease from this statement, behold your God, but let's go a bit deeper into this. Because it not only speaks of God's involvement, but it tells us of the nature of God. Because I want to ask the question, why is the word your used? Why does Isaiah not just say, behold, God? Why does Isaiah have the words, behold, your God? Well, there are two observations that come to mind there. One is it speaks to the unique nature of God, and also that word, your, speaks to the personal nature of their God. And bringing it back to this God is statement, it tells us that God is unique and God is personal. So let's look at the uniqueness part. What does this word tell us of the uniqueness of God? Well, we know this much. The people of Israel in this time, uh, we know that they would have been acquainted with. Some might have actually fallen into the worship of the other gods serving the nations, other idols. But we know what those idols were like, given the whole narrative of Scripture. Psalm 135, for instance. Psalm 135, starting in verse 15, tells us this. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but don't speak. They have eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. This reality of the idols of the nations, the gods of the nations, where they would be formed by human hands, metal or wood. They would have mouths, but they, they, they don't speak. They have eyes, they don't see. They have ears, but do not hear. That whole reality stands in stark contrast to Israel's God, a God who speaks, who sees them, and he hears their cry. This speaks to the uniqueness, the uniqueness of Israel's God. Then we come to the personal nature. God is involved, God is unique, but also God is personal. He's coming to them. He's engaging with them. And not only in his engagement with them is, is that a fact in itself, his engagement tells them that he's inviting them into that relationship. The fact is not a fact alone. The fact is an invitation. Let me just tell a couple stories here to put this in perspective. The picture and the enormity of what's happening in, in these words here. Years ago, I worked on the Toronto Blue Jays ground crew. Uh, baseball club there, and uh, it was a dream job. I loved the job, but I was on the ground crew, and that's a very professional way of saying that we just worked with dirt and clay. And most of our job was not during the game, it was pregame, where we would uh, repair everything on the field, from the base pass to home plate to pitcher's mound, everything, the bullpens, everything, we repaired all that stuff, made sure it was game ready. And so during the day, I would, my job for three of the four years that I worked there was working on the pitcher's mound. So every cleat hole, everything had to be filled in by hand, and then it was quite a meticulous job. I'm very proud of it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, near the end of the shift, that, that pregame shift or the pre-batting practice shift, an hour before we had to get off the field for the players, uh, our, our boss, the chief groundskeeper, would come down and inspect everything that's going on. 
But the thing about my boss was we knew that he had you know, a cubicle in our ground room, our locker room, but he also had an office up where what we called the suits, where all the suits were. The general manager, the, vi the vice president of operations, the, the president, the ownership, everything of the team was on this 300 level where the suites were. And my boss would come down to inspect the work an hour before we had to get off the field. And he'd come down and he'd have you know, these really you know, these pressed uh, dress pants on. He'd have a nice crisp dress shirt, nice brown shoes. And that stood in stark contrast to our dress code, which was sport pants, running shoes, t-shirt with you know, ground crew emblazoned on it. And by that point, we were, we had, you know, our hands were, you know, had that orangey brown clay color on it. We had clay and dirt on our shirts, on our pants, on our shoes. And there came our boss down from the 300 level. But it was only within the span of 15 minutes after he had inspected our work that he too came out. And when he came out, after inspecting the work, he came out looking just like us. Running shoes on, sport pants, the t-shirt. And by the time we had gotten off the field for the player's batting practice, he looked just like us. Clay on his shoes, clay on his shirt, clay on his pants. Because he not only came to inspect, he did not just come to give instructions, he got his hands dirty. He was down on his knees, filling in these different cleat holes, using the power machines just like us to smooth out the clay. He came down to help us not just give instructions, but actually get his hands dirty. That's a type of picture of God coming down to us, relating to us, getting in the muck of our lives. He comes down to us. Now, there are stories after stories that, we can, that probably come to mind of, that capture this picture of God coming down to us. But the reality is this. If we just see it as understanding the things of God and becoming acquainted with that, full stop, then we've missed it. Because that fact, again, is an invitation. Because what I've learned, and I know many of us here have learned, is actually you can be very clued up on the things of God without actually knowing Him. And if you miss the latter, you miss the whole game. You miss the whole show. Years ago, I was speaking at a university in Oklahoma, and I'll never forget this. After this event, me and a few colleagues were there speaking, and after the event, we had a chance to talk to the chaplain of the university. And that point, at that point, he had been chaplain at the university for 30 years. And he said to us, you know, it's interesting, I hear you guys talking about the message of Jesus and inviting people to commit their lives to him. He said, I think you'd find it interesting to know that I had been a chaplain here for 18 years. In other words, I had you know, done weddings, I had done funerals, I had counseled students, I had preached hundreds of sermons, but it was only after 18 years of doing this that I finally actually put my trust in Jesus. He was doing the whole thing. He was pastoring people. He was ministering. He, was, he knew all the liturgy. He knew better than probably everybody to whom he was ministering, yet he actually hadn't put his trust in Jesus. You can know a lot about Jesus. You can be acquainted with the scriptures better than people who have actually committed their life to Jesus. But if you have not committed yourself to Jesus, then you missed it. That personal relationship. Some of us are also reminded perhaps of the story of John Wesley. John Wesley, who is this, you know, this bastion of Christianity in the 18th century, one of the great revivalists, he too had the same dilemma that he needed to figure out. He, uh, at the age of 32, traveled from England by boat to uh, Georgia to minister to the Indians in Georgia there, and he was confronted by a friend. He had this spirited conversation in which one guy said to him, my brother, this was his friend saying to Wesley, my brother, do you know Jesus Christ? I know that Jesus Christ died for my sins, said Wesley. It's friend, that's not what I asked you. Do you know Jesus Christ? I hope he has died to save me, stammered Wesley. His friend got a bit heated at this point. He said, do you know yourself? 
No. I long to know Jesus Christ, said Wesley. And this is what he wrote into his journal on the way back to England. I went to America to convert the Indians. But oh, who shall convert me? I have a fair summer religion. I can talk well. Nay, and I believe myself when no danger is near. But let death look me in the face and my spirit is troubled. Nor can I say to die is gain. I have a sort of fear that when I have spun my last thread, I shall perish on the shore. I have learned that I who went to America to convert others was not converted myself. God is unique. God is personal and he invites us into that. So here's the question for us. Does that resonate with us or do we sense a disconnect to that reality? That's the big question. God is unique. God is personal. But as we move along, we see in verse 10, in God's coming, we see that God is strong. He is strong. He is sovereign. And he is shepherd. Behold, the Lord comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And verse 11, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. What is that telling us? It's telling us that when God comes, he's strong, he's sovereign, and he's shepherd. That again is speaking to the questions we have in our own hearts. Is God powerful enough? You better believe that was one of the questions they were asking in that moment. Okay, th this is amazing, but is he, is he strong enough? Because have you seen the power of Babylon? Oh, he's strong enough. That, that word, uh, God's arm, has with the idea of this militaristic strength. Oh, he's strong enough. And by the way, he's sovereign too. He's in charge. He hasn't taken his hands off the wheel. And he's also shepherd. Now, I want to suggest to you, I think that would have been a bit of a strange word there. And not only do we get the word shepherd, it's the description that is very intimate and personal and caring. Because if, you, if we do a quick panorama view of all the gods going back, way back to mythological times to even today, you will see many gods, whether it be even in the monotheistic faiths or pantheistic faiths that are strong. Many gods who are strong. But you don't have gods who are strong, sovereign. They, they might stop there. But you will not get a god who is strong, sovereign, and he actually cares. And not only cares, we get explicit detail. What is, this, what is a shepherd going to be like? He's going to gather you like a lamb in his arms. He's going to carry you in his bosom. In other words, he's going to carry you close to his heart. That's this God. That's this king. Yes, he, there's royalty coming. And he's going to be powerful. He's, he's in control, but he's also, he cares about you. He's going to get close. He's going to carry you and gently lead you. That is Israel's God. That is, that is our God. That is the source of their joy. That when this God comes, he speaks tenderly. He speaks comfort. It does not end in judgment. This is Israel's God revealed in the person of Jesus. So I want to close with one question and one application. One question that we have to ask ourselves what are the spots in our life right now, if we're to be really honest, brutally honest, what are the spots in our life right now that we would say we don't really believe God is working? I just think about that for a moment. Because it's not stuff we even say. It might not even be stuff that actually if someone were to ask us, we'd say it. it's way back there. It's tucked way back. It's default setting. It's just something we think and feel, but we don't actually articulate. We have trouble articulating that. But we've actually counted him out because we've had years of praying or we've been in years of 
something, when, when, it might be a health issue, it might be a relationship issue, it might be a work issue, but we've effectively said, okay, he's not working there. Got to move on. I've just got to move on. And the words of Isaiah challenge us this morning and remind us and tell us, behold, your God. He's involved in your life every spot. Turn to him. Surrender to him. He's involved. He's unique. He is personal. He's strong. He's sovereign. He's shepherd. The question is, for many of us, how do we connect it all? Because it, all, it could all be intellectual, and that in itself could be really helpful. But how do we connect the head to the heart? I want to give you just maybe one suggestion. And the suggestion is worship. Worship. Well, what does that mean? Because for some of us, that's, that's probably thinking, we're probably thinking, oh, oh that's typical. Oh, yeah. That's the application. Oh, the application is worship. Okay. <laughs> but let's flesh that out. What do I mean by that? Worship, in this sense, means we're combining the bringing of our questions, all our perplexity, all our lack of understanding, how we don't get this. I want to trust you, God, but I don't get this. We bring all that to God while also affirming who he is. That's, that's almost the, the center of worship, how we don't, it's not an eyes closed activity where we like, oh, we just have to forget about the hardship, we have to forget about the physical reality and, and just pretend that God is still in control. No, actually worship, the, the dynamism of worship is actually bringing all that stuff, bringing it to him, and at the same time affirming who he is in our singing, but also other acts of worship. In other words, it's saying, God, I don't get this, but I'm affirming who you are, that you are the God who brings comfort. You are the God who comes, you get close, you're involved in my life, you speak to me. I don't understand all this, and I'm, that's, that's really hard for me, but you are still that same God. That is worship. That's possibly one of the ways in which the, that we, we meet that journey of the head to the heart. And for me, speaking personally, there's a song that I'm sure some of you know. Uh, it's called Waymaker. And that has actually been enormously helpful for me because in a way, I feel it captures so much of what's happening in Isaiah. These are just some of the words in that song, Waymaker. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. So that's, there's that declare that there's that, that there's that affirming aspect that you're here, God, because that's what that's what the Christian faith tells me. That's what Jesus come to earth in first century Palestine tells me that you make yourself known. And then it continues. You are the way maker. You're the miracle worker. You're the promise keeper. You're the light in the darkness. My God. Again, that's Isaiah language. Your God. My God. That's who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. What's that saying? It's saying that I don't understand this, but I'm still standing by this God because I've got all these questions and there's a lot of angst. I don't have the answers to these questions, but I'm bringing them to you. And I'm also declaring you are still that God. You are the way maker. You are the God who makes himself known. You keep your promises. You are the light in the darkness. And the thing about what God gives us is, is, speaking to our lack of understanding, Paul has this language of a peace that passes all understanding. The peace that God gives is not against rationality. No, it's a peace so profound that it actually surpasses our limited understanding. So it's not antithetical to understanding. It's not like anti-rationality. No, it actually goes and almost just passes through that. It's just as real, but it's beyond understanding. That is what happens in worship. Bringing our questions and also affirming who he is. God is involved. He's unique. He's personal. He's strong, sovereign, and shepherd. Israel's coming king is our coming king, is your coming king. He has come for you. 
That is our source of joy. Let's pray. Lord, we help us to rest in that. Help us to rest in the truth that you've given us, not only in words, but by physical expression. You have come in the person of Jesus Christ. Israel's coming king has come in Jesus. Help us, Lord, today to remember that, to somehow internalize that truth. Enable us to live for you. Fill us afresh with your spirit, your spirit who brings us joy. In your name, amen.